I, I wanted to just um, <clears throat> make a comment and ask your response to it. I'm in the field of mental health, and I'm very, very interested in the kind of research that you do. Um, but I think there's a kind of an irony that's going on currently in our, in our society. There is so much interest in genetics and biogenetic determinants of so many of these illnesses. And as far as I understand, one of the interesting parts of it is that there is a genetic component so far that we've seen in almost everything from temperament to, any, to, to every mental illness. But what's really interesting is that that genetic disposition is at best 50% and most are much less than that. The environment is actually paradoxically uh, playing a very strong role. And what I, what I think is a little bit concerning to me is that <clears throat> I rarely hear about what we can do to bring a consciousness around the environmental factors. I'll give you an example. When I think about, for example, young children in school, there are very, very few programs that really educate children about uh, the impact of empathy, learning how to be empathic, learning the impact of empathy in terms of wellness and mental health, um, who help children understand that one of the things that drugs and alcohol do are often are, are treat an underlying anxiety disorder, that they're anxiolytics, and helping them understand that drugs and alcohol can be a problem because they're really dealing with anxiety and they can become addictive for that reason. It, it's kind of remarkable how much we're not doing in terms of really addressing the environmental issues. And I just wonder what your thoughts are, you know, as someone who's really focused on the biogenetics uh, and the structural part of the brain, are we at really, are we at a point where we're actually making a mistake to really look at the 50 to 75 percent of the variance, which seems to still indicate is very environmental? Yeah, I, I really like your comments, and, and um, I kind of reframe them a little bit. I, you know, I, I think the um, everything that we're learning uh, supports what you're saying. Everything we're learning, especially about how the brain develops, is that. Uh, the importance of experience in crafting and sculpting those networks. Uh, some of that is hardwired, but uh, at the most molecular level, it's not. So um, there's a need to explore that. There is, uh, in the way that we think about it now, and if I had to sort of pinpoint an area for the next uh, two or three years where I think there'll be the most um, important innovation and the most important uh, set of discoveries, it's very much in this interaction between um, the environment and biology. There's a term for it now called epigenetics, which gives you actually the tools you need to be able to um, look at how the environment is changing those networks and how the environment is having this impact. But what you're saying about, you know, we don't really need that. You don't need to see an epigenetic modification to be able to to know that it may be helpful to teach empathy to children, right? Uh, and so there's an awful lot we can do short of, of those kinds of experiments or not even dependent upon those kinds of experiments. The one place where I think I'd probably um, part ways with where you're going, and it's I think an important distinction to make is that um, there are some very important things we can do to uh, reduce um, conduct problems, to reduce problems with uh, even maybe with mood disorders and with anxiety. But we haven't yet found anything that really bends the curve for schizophrenia, for autism, or for even bipolar illness. And so, and those are really kind of the three targets that we have most of all within our institute. So, and that's not to say that we won't. I mean, it could very well be that, in fact, I happen to believe this passionately, that the most important intervention that we will have for schizophrenia in 2020 will not be a medication. It will be something that we now call cognitive remediation. It will be uh, developing a video game for a seven-year-old that causes their frontal cortex to, to rewire in such a way that they don't become psychotic when they're 19. We think that schizophrenia begins at birth, and we think psychosis is the, the last stage of it. So to go back to this Tucson story, if you had had a way of knowing that this was a seven-year-old who was on that path, and how we would do that is another difficult public health question. 
uh, it could be that it's, you know, it's not that you want to put this kid on an antipsychotic medication because he's not psychotic, but what you want to do is to give him the sorts of tools and give his family the sorts of tools and his school the sorts of tools that they would need to make sure that he doesn't become psychotic. Or if he does, it's after he's married and has three kids and has already finished graduate school and has an occupation, so he has a better context in which that happens. So I think that's the future, and so in that sense I'm agreeing with you. I must say, we don't yet know how to do that, but that's all the more reason, as Kennedy said, you know, you do it because it's hard, not because it's easy. You have to, we, those are really the kinds of things that we ought to be working on. And, and um, I think actually this whole business about understanding brain development and understanding brain pathways is a way to get us there, get us focused on that, because that's probably going to give us the clues about what those different kinds of cognitive games will have to be to be able to rewire and to get uh, healthy development. Adina, want to wait for the mic? Can you bring it up? I wondered if you'd comment on the increased suicides in the Army. Um, in listening to what you said about the amount of time it takes the brain to develop, we're sending young men and women into the field at a time when their brains are not totally developed and may be changing in very strange ways under fire. It's a tough question, isn't it? We, we don't know actually what the, what the drivers are completely. We're looking at this very carefully with the Army because they're trying to figure it out. There are lots of ideas and lots of theories and, and you know, the extent to which this is due to someone's exposure to combat, which is what all of us assumed. I mean, I went into this project saying, oh, come on, you know, you deploy people three times to Afghanistan or Iraq, how can you be surprised? If you've read David Finkel's book that got a uh, you know, Pulitzer Prize called Good Soldiers, after you read that, you think, why doesn't everybody in the Army have PTSD? This is such a traumatic experience. It's not that simple. It turns out that um, about 71% of the suicides are in the first year before they're deployed. So we're not sure what's going on. We think part of it is the possibility that some of these soldiers um, were recruited uh, who would not maybe have been recruited in years past. And we're seeing uh, soldiers who have a mental health history, which would have kept them out of the Army in 2001 or 2002. Uh, but the demands of running two wars and now having so many different active theaters uh, and, the, and the workforce problem where there's no draft, they have got to bring in soldiers. And um, I, one of the things the Army's done is they've created what they've called a waiver system. So there are more waivers than they've ever had before. So that's a question, and we're, we're looking into it. But uh, it's a scientific question still in search of the real data. We don't yet know exactly what the driver is. Um. <coughs> Let me uh, see if I can just pose perhaps two questions here relating to the uh, Tucson incident. Uh, we know that the, uh, the shooter was identified with having mental illness uh, a long time ago and you know, behavioral issues that showed up in any number of phases of his life. Uh, you talked about two to three million people with untreated, I think that was the number you used, uh, untreated mental illness. What, what do you think represents a fair uh, action in terms of intercepting these individuals that respects civil rights and yet takes into need mm -hmm. the needs of society? As the, that's my first question. Second one, hopefully, that's a little. That's easy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> and the second one is, you know, again, in light of what happened to the Congresswoman, the regenerative capability of a brain to recircuit yeah. itself. Thank you. Yeah, so um, on the first question, I, you know, I'm going to throw that back at the group. I think this is a, a question for society to grapple with. How do you find the right balance between public safety and individual rights? And uh, we've always struggled with this. There's no simple answer to it, and I, but I think you can't duck it. Uh, and what happened last week raises this question again. Uh, you know, we want to protect the rights of people who may be eccentric and different. Uh, and we're not very good, well, strike that, we're not good at all at being able to predict who's going to be violent. But we know that if someone has 
a serious mental illness, particularly a paranoid illness uh, like paranoid schizophrenia, and they're not treated, that they're at a higher risk, much higher risk for being violent. But those are the very people who don't want to come into treatment, may not realize that they even have a problem. That's part of having this illness. And at what point do you incarcerate or at what point do you involuntarily uh, treat them is, is a tough question that I think we're always struggling with. And we, different states have done this in different ways. Um, and um, we, I don't think anybody has found quite the right um, balance, but it's something that is a great uh, area of public discourse. On the, on the question of uh, you know, what we can expect from the Congresswoman, uh, it's really a tough call. I, will, I think the, uh, her brain at her age is not going to rewire uh, nearly as much as it would have if the same thing had happened to a two-year-old or um, uh, someone at a very early stage of brain development. But um, you, you simply can't predict uh, easily, um, and I haven't actually even seen good diagrams of what the lesion is, but it is quite possible that she can recover an enormous amount of function. Um, you know, the, the key here is that she didn't bleed as extensively as she might have if, if the bullet had gone from left to right. It never crossed the midline. So uh, she's had essentially a unilateral lesion that'll look a lot like a stroke. And it depends really on how many areas that took out in uh, but what always shocks people who don't deal with uh, the human brain anatomy is you can destroy a lot of uh, brain territory. Uh, you can take away a lot of the geography and still not see much of, a, of an impact in an adult. So it's the only way to know is uh, on an individual basis, and you'll, you'll know in probably about four to six weeks as they begin, she recovers function, you begin to see how far she'll go.